Good evening. It's lovely to be uh, with you. I do thank you for the invitation to uh, to come and share God's word uh, with you. David's just alluded to the fact of uh, the rather chaotic couple of days that I've had, and my mum uh, fell over with a shopping trolley coming out of Aldi yesterday, and she has um, a broken shoulder and a fractured wrist, so she's uh, been in hospital. Um, you do love, don't you, about 10 hours in A&E, you know, waiting to be seen. Uh, I did love the, uh, the section of life that you get to see on a Saturday afternoon and evening in A&E, and it's quite a revelation, really, uh, to you. We were only saying, my wife and I, the other day, that we, we sometimes feel that we live in a bubble, even in our own street. Apparently, we, because we haven't got a dog... We don't get to know a lot of what goes on in our street, which if you have a dog, you do, because you take it in the park, you walk with all the neighbours, you get to hear all the gossip. We, we sadly don't have a dog, we have fish. So we are completely in a bubble, as it were. Uh, but it, it is interesting to see and uh, the way that sometimes your life can change dramatically in in a few moments, and we do really have to trust the Lord of glory. And what a privilege it is to be able to, to have someone that we can trust and to have that knowledge and that assurance in our lives. Thank you for your prayers. Um, if anybody doesn't know me, I know there are people here from all the way over in five ways. I know it's a long way, long trek. Um, my name's Martin Pearson. I've trekked all the way uh, over the Dudley Hills uh, from the promised land of Blackheath to be here in uh, deepest Gornal uh, this, this Sunday evening. It's a joy to be here. Um, as I say, my name's Martin Pearson. Uh, I'm, I work full-time for Slavic Gospel Association. Uh, I know I'm very grateful for the support that the church here has been sending to the mission over the year, I know. And I do thank you for that. We do appreciate uh, the, the tremendous help uh, that we get. If anybody doesn't know who Slavic Gospel Association are, uh, we do very much as we, as our name says, what, what, what's the advert that says? Does what it says on the tin, <laughs> in that we speak with, we work predominantly with the evan evangelical church in Slavic speaking countries. Slavic is a Russian type tongue. So we work in areas such as Romania, Bulgaria, uh, down in Macedonia, um, uh, Mold Moldova as well, uh, into Hungary, which is not really a Slavic-speaking uh, country, as before anybody starts shouting at me. <laughs> They're not really Slavic, but we don't restrict ourselves too, too tightly. Uh, gospel, the gospel is at the heart of everything that we do. And association really is because down through the years and the year after next, that's 2020, SGA or Slavic Gospel Association will be 70 years young and it has a, a wonderful way, history of God using people in the UK to draw alongside and to associate with our brothers and sisters in Slavic countries who have in some cases are very bereft of any help and in the communist days, if you go back 20, 30 years particularly, were really under the cosh and really under pressure. And we've been privileged to be associated with them and to help them in teaching, training, in finance, in the provision of materials and for different projects down through the years that has enhanced their church life and but also made them stronger in the gospel. You know, the gospel, this, is quite a quite a radical thing if you have been brought up as an orthodox believer in Moldova or R Romania. Yes, you know of God. You know of religion. You know how to dress up on special occasions. You know how to go into, a, like when I did preach here on the carol service, the candlelit, into a dark, foreboding church filled with incense. But sadly, you know nothing of Christ or very little of Christ. Or if you've been brought up predominantly in a Roman Catholic country, such as Poland, you know very little of Christ. 
you're really only allowed to find out what you can through the priest. I don't know if, I don't know if people realize that within the Roman Catholic Church, whether you, you have any Roman Catholic friends. I remember saying to a girl I used to work, I, only, I see her every Christmas, we exchange Christmas cards. And I remember working with her for a number of years and I says, Louise, what Bible do you read? Meaning, did you read the authorized or did you read the New King James? She says, I haven't got a Bible. And yet this was a lady who went to mass every week, you know, and family was brought up. My mom, very strong Roman Catholic. And I said, well, what Bible do you, she says, oh, we don't have a Bible. The priest has a Bible, but we don't have a Bible. That's been the way that the Roman Catholic Church has really operated for many years, that it all comes through the priest. There's no individual. What a wonder <laughs> when you suddenly, like Martin Luther, read the scriptures and say, hang on, I'm justified by faith. <laughs> not by obeying the priest. The gospel is a wonderful, radical thing. We've been privileged to work with the brothers and sisters who know that, who have lived it in the, the difficult days that communism brought. They live it today in difficult circumstances because although in many cases communism fell, it still rules under a different name. So just remember your brothers and sisters out in Slovakia and such like who are seeking to to reach the lost, the really lost people of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. One project we've been involved in this year involves reaching people in cooperation with our American sister mission, also called SGA, uh, to reach the very far east of Russia. So far, it's almost America. <laughs> it's where Russia meets Alaska and such like. And there's a massive area there uh, not many people really comparatively to the area uh, of, of country and they live in really remote areas that the only way you can get to is to fly there. And so we have a project at the moment to reach Russia now and it involves providing planes, pastors and pilots in order to get the message there. We call it Reach Russia Now because Russia has brought in laws that really make pro proclamation of the gospel illegal. They have instituted laws. The only problem is the country is so big, they have trouble policing <laughs> the very edges of the country. So we need to do it now. And we have a wonderful opportunity working in conjunction with uh, Kingdom Airlines in, in Alaska who provide the planes. So we have many things going on down to just as we've done over this Christmas time and we have done for the last probably 20 years. Someone came with an idea that around all the time that the Romanian orphanages were being exposed for what they were and the terrible places that they were. One of the brothers who led SGA at the time said, but every time in the scriptures it talks about, widow, uh, about orphans, it also talks about widows. And that's amazing how it does. It always uses the two. And so SGA at that time started a widows project. And the idea was in the first year, that they could give 50 pounds, doesn't sound a lot, does it, 50 pounds, but that can provide a lot of timber to keep the fires going over the winter and keep people warm. 50 pounds to a widow, given through the church, given evangelistically in some cases to non-believers. And the idea was that they could give 50 pounds to 250 widows. And the response in the UK was incredible from churches and, and people in the UK. And it still <laughs> is incredible, the response that comes in to the degree that 250 widows, that has been replicated probably over 20,000 times in the intervening period. And so we still send out every, particularly at Christmas time, uh, to Macedonia, to many places in Romania, uh, to Poland, uh, and also to Moldova as well, particularly uh, for widows project there. So there are big projects on the anvil in terms of planes, but they're also wonderfully down to earth, simple projects. So thank you for your interest. Unfortunately, when I left the office 10 days ago, I forgot to again bring any of the latest <laughs> literature with me. So I do apologize. I haven't got any to give out, <laughs> but it's a long time before Christmas, isn't it? To try and remember what you need afterwards Christmas. But thank you for your, for your prayers and, and for your support. Um, I'd like to speak to you tonight with a Christmas sort of related message, if I could, um, I'm going to read an, an unusual Christmas passage 
from the scriptures. Would you like to turn to the book of Ephesians if you have a Bible with you? The book of Ephesians in chapter 1. I trust you've had a, a wonderful Christmas time, that you've got all that you wanted off Santa, all the gifts. You may be wearing some tonight, I don't know. But uh, I want us to just think about the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly. Somebody said to me some time ago, when you come to preach, Martin, we always know that what you're going to preach about and that it's Christ. Well, I don't really know anything else that's worth preaching about. If somebody can suggest something, I might think about it. But preaching Christ is a, is a wonderful thing, and that it's so important. And at Christmas time, of course, our, our thoughts are focused upon the gift of Christ. In the first chapter of the letter to uh, the Ephesians, after a, a sort of introductory few verses, through to verse 18, uh, verse 17, um, Paul says this to the Ephesians, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places because he's far above principality and power, might and dominion and every name that he's named, not only in this world but also in that world which is to come and has put all things under his feet and given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, for your pastor's benefit, I will remind you, I was reading there from the NIV, the Northern Ireland version, We live in a day and age where the scriptures and within that the Christmas story is coming under ever more scrutiny and ever more opposition. And I believe the time is fast approaching, if it's not already here, where the things of Christianity are very much in the balance and in the scales. And the focus should be at this time of year and in this last week upon the things of Christ. But of course, as we know, for many, they have dismissed the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, the things of Christmas, the things of Scripture, as just hogwash, really, and of no relevance to today's society. But Paul says something, I think, very important about Christ. He says a lot of important things, and we could be here many hours tonight considering what there. But I never speak for more than an hour and three quarters, um, so don't worry. Um, but he says some important things, particularly in the verse that we read in chapter 2, in verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace 
in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. And it was being faced with a, 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 a speaking a few times in the lead up to Christmas and then around the Christmas time that I was really brought to that verse there. And I'll just share one thing that, that really brought it to me. I was asked to do a presentation for SGA at our recent conference. And we support, uh, one of the areas that I didn't mention earlier is that we support out in Kazakhstan where there are a lot of Slavic-speaking people that have sort of migrated and emigrated down into Kazakhstan. And we do, we support quite a few, uh, a number of projects. We've got a, a project on at the moment to provide a Kazakh Bible into that land. Um, uh, we, we're we just waiting for the text to be revised and for it to be printed and for 100,000 Kazakh Bibles. They've uh, would you believe, I may have said this before I was here, but the, the only time Kazakh-speaking people have read about Jesus is in a Bible that is in the Russian language. They've never read about Christ in their own language. Can you? We can't understand that, can we? Eh? How, many, how many different versions can we read of the Christmas? How many have we got here tonight? Uh, how many books can we go and buy in CLC and such like? How many can we send off on the internet? But in, in our own language. Incredible, isn't it? But yet there are countries in the world where they, they haven't got the scriptures in their own language. And so we're uh, involved in a project to, to get the Kazakh in the Kazakh language, a good translation of the Bible in Kazakh there. One of the brothers that we support works with a peculiar tribe of people that are called the Uyghurans. And I was asked to do a presentation about the work that they do. So it involved quite a bit of re research. We Gorans, by the way, they're not, a, they're not a small sect of the Free Presbyterian Church in Scotland, but they are uh, really uh, an ethnic group that predominantly live in China, but 300,000 live in Kazakhstan. And this one family that we support are seeking to reach these Uyghurian people. There are 10 million of them altogether. And it was this stark fact that they, they virtually know nothing of Christ. And their lives are dominated by a most unusual combination of um, the occult and Islam. What an unusual combination. And it was that point, what a, to be bereft of the wonder of the Christmas story, to be bereft of the message of the gospel in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was that that really stared me and steered me to this verse here, knowing that I'd got to preach over Christmas time. That the riches that we have in Christ, and yet we dismiss them. We can't be bothered with them. And yet people are living in darkness, that their lives are dominated by either Islam or the occult. I cannot really begin to imagine but I do know that this family that we support are seeking to reach out through very practical. And it's, they have to just get the trust of the people first. They can't just go and preach to them. It would mean nothing. They have to live along in, amongst them, work with them, and seek to share with them the wonders of Christ. The riches that we have in Christ. Paul has just said in this passage, by grace... He saved us. By grace we are saved. Not of works, not of anything that we are, not of any goodness that we have in ourselves, as much as we like to think that we are, not of anything of ourselves, but out of his grace he has saved us. Somebody has very cleverly said, grace, the, the letters of the word, are God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's true. Grace we are saved. And he, he says he's raised us together to sit with him in heavenly places. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel like I'm sitting in heavenly places every day. But that's what Paul says. That's the measure of what God in Christ has done for us. And it's by grace. It's a gift of God. Now, some people will say cynically, ah, oh, but this is written 2,000 years ago and it's, it's written in a Judaistic context doesn't have anything, really any meaning for us today. Well, I'd like to argue that it does. How does this scripture weigh up 
in today's society. Are, we, are these just words that were written 2,000 years ago and therefore have no relevance, have no meaning to us today? Well, I trust they may. If they don't now, by the time I finish speaking, they might have some relevance to you. How do they weigh up against today's technologically advanced, knowledge-abounding world? As Christianity, as the message of Christ, as the Christmas message, lost its real weight and effect, and as it become, instead of being like the weighty snooker ball on one side of the scales, has it become just a shell of a ping pong ball on the other? How does the Christian story, the Christmas story, if we want to just call it that for, for simplicity tonight, how does that weigh against science, against technology, against learning, against the materialistic and the consumeristic world in which we live? How does it weigh against all the mysticism that is in the world? How does it compare to all the religions that are in the world that nearly in most cases know nothing of grace but are dominated by what you can do and the works that you can do? And of course we live in a world that seems to me to be becoming more and more uh, dominated by the entertainment value that anything has. How does the Christmas story weigh against that? Well, I'd like to say that it weighs pretty well, actually. <laughs> it is a weighty story, and I'd like to explain why I say that. Because while all that list of things that I've mentioned, science, technology, learning, materialism, consumerism, while that all panders to our lusts of the flesh, Paul describes it as, the things that we find pleasing, the lusts of our flesh, the lusts of our heart, and the lusts of our mind. None of those things address the core fundamental problem that man has. And that fundamental problem is sin. That's the problem. Today we rose to the fact that just the other side of Blackheath, someone in the middle of last night was murdered for whatever reason. I said about that we live in a bubble that just two weeks ago, I noticed a hamblin an ambulance at the bottom of the street. And then I find out that next door neighbors, just four houses from where we live, two men from the one house had kicked the other neighbor in an argument over a garden wall, would you believe, to the degree that he's broken his pelvis. And that at the other end of the street, at the top of the hill, I'm not trying to put you off moving to Rowley, by the way, in this, you know, but as I think about it, I think, well, it's probably the same wherever you live. But sometimes it just seems as it's on you. That a grandson had, again, assaulted his grandmother in order to fuel his desire for drink and for drugs to the degree that he's now in custody awaiting charge. And these things have gone on some time ago. We didn't know anything. That's why we live in a bubble, you see. We're a little bit protective from it. And then you see, like yesterday, you see all these difficulties and then you hear the conversations of, of people and you think, you know, there's an awful lot of people in this world who've got really bad lives. Distraught situations, awful situations. And most of it is the result of sin. And none of these things that I've mentioned here address that problem at all. Nobody wants to address it, do they? Except the scriptures. The gospel does. The message of Christ addresses this problem. And it's when we realise what gift God has really given us in Christ. And when we start to unwrap it, <laughs> we then begin to see, wow, this is no just plastic little toy 
that we've been given. Do you ever get a Christmas present and you can't resist the temptation before that, that day arrives that you pick it up and you... Joe and Betty A bought me much this year. But oh, then, sometimes when you unwrap it, oh, I didn't expect to find that. I know it doesn't weigh much, but it's, that's quite precious. I really like that. In some cases, it might be really worth something. <laughs> so when we begin to unwrap the gift that God has given us in Christ and we begin to see the hidden features, if you, if you like, of, of Christ that sometimes we don't think about and people don't talk about when they talk about the Christmas story, as David has reminded us, some, some people love the baby Jesus, but they don't like all that baby Jesus brings to the party, as it were. In fact, this gift is not like Joe and Betty's little lightweight thing, but it, it's so heavy that we go, oh, <laughs> I can't hold this, I can't take it in. And that is the measure of what God has given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. For within the gift of grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, and Paul clearly says it all comes through Christ. Christ is the pivot. Christ is the focus. Christ is the center of all of this. And I believe Paul is intimating at two different aspects. One, that the gifts from God are both deep and profound, and also he alludes within these scriptures that these gifts have a wonderful guarantee. They have a wonderful foundation. I don't know if you've had anything for Christmas, and it's broken already. That quite often happens, doesn't it? It's broken already. The guarantee. Oh, you know, sometimes our product is so good, we'll give you six months guarantee. Six months? <laughs> I've told the story that some friends of ours who only live up in Jews Lane, when we got married 37 years ago, they, they bought us an electric tin opener. They weren't lung on the market, I don't think, 37 years ago. We had an electric tin opener. And only about two years ago, it started to go that it wouldn't hold the cans and you couldn't get the thing in and everything. And so I went to, to Terry and I said to him, Terry, would you have the receipt? <laughs> <laughs> That's lasted a long while. It was a, it was a good piece of equipment. But so often, things don't last, do they? particularly in this day's world. And the throwaway society that we are today, it almost fuels that. But in Christ, we see deep and profound things and we see guarantees and foundations that have an eternal guarantee. Deep and profound gifts? Because within the gift of Christ to us that was fulfilled by his travels to Calvary and then through the grave and returning to his Father, that we then have the gifts within that gift of things like, now this is not an extensive list, this is just a short taster. You ever go to a restaurant and they give you a taster menu, you know, just a little bit of all these different things? That's what I'm going to do now for a few moments. Justification. Justification comes through Christ. What does justification mean? Well, it's that God is saying to you, hell-deserving sinner that you are, and me, I'm not pointing the finger at you, hell-deserving sinners that we are, that he says to us, guilty as you are, I pronounce you because I can, that you are not guilty. That's essentially justification. You can write books on it for all you want, but essentially that's what it is. And God can do that. God can say that we are not guilty. Why? Because of the sacrifice of Christ. That's just one of the things that comes in this wonderful gift that we're trying to unwrap a little tonight. Salvation. Salvation. Again, the religions of the world are not offering that, are they? Or if they are, they're offering a very peculiar version of it. And it's only achievable in some cases by doing some horrendous things. 
by grace you are saved. All God calls us to do, he gives it through his grace and he calls us in faith just to trust him. Like a child, trust him, the mom and the dad. That's if they can do that anymore, of course. <laughs> Political correctness doesn't seem to want to let the children do that. I used to love it when our children used to go to the park, you know. Our, it's also today my son's 30th birthday. Exactly 30 years ago, we had a wonderful gift of this little baby boy. He's now <laughs> towers over me <laughs> and he's 30 today. I used to love when he used to go to the, the park that we live by and he, He'd climb up on the, the railings and he'd, he'd get on the top and he'd just try and get the climb on. I caught him most of the time. <laughs> but he had that trust. It's dad, he's going to catch me. And that's what we need with God. That he is our father. That he has provided all this wonderful provision for us. And he just wants us to throw ourselves, as it were, into him. Justification, salvation, the atonement. Again, science can't provide the atoning work that Christ did. Many of the religions of the world don't have that option. It's not there. But it's part of this great structure that God has given us in Christ that makes the gift of Christ that we celebrate at Christmas so, well, special is just not the word for it, is it? It's just wonderful. At one meant with God. And that can lead in our lives to, to sanctification. And the gift of the babe at Bethlehem gave us not only the crucified Saviour, but the risen Saviour that is Christ. And in Christ, as Paul says in here and in many places, God was reconciling us to himself. That's just a, a little board of things that God has, has given to us that all come, how? Through us? Through the, no, they come through Christ. That's why I say if you've just pulled back the layer of this gift, this Christmas of Christ and said, okay, I'll, no, you need to open it. You need to realise what God has given us in there. And all of these things come because of who God is. Here is a God who is sovereign, who strangely can do whatever he wants to. That's a little bit scary, isn't it, in a way? And we don't particularly like that. But that is the God that we serve. He could have dismissed us in his sovereignty, but in his sovereignty he sent Christ in order to redeem Redemption, there's another one I haven't, I haven't mentioned. To be redeemed, to be bought back for the price for salvation to be paid. But God is sovereign. Again, it's a, it's a difficult subject, isn't it? And we don't always understand. Yesterday, why, why does my mom go down the curb in that way? And change all the, the dynamics and all the balance of life in such a big way for us. I sat with a girl in the hospital yesterday, a lovely girl, 22 years old, law student, one year to go. And about two months ago, all of a sudden, she becomes epileptic. No previous history of her, I think there is in the family, but with her. And all of a sudden, she starts having seizures. And she's having up to 70 a day. Five minutes later, she had one. <laughs> Quite alarming to see, really. All of a sudden in A&E, there were 12 medics in the waiting room uh, and she was rushed off. Fortunately, my wife saw her later. She does recover from these, but the outlook for her is, is bleak. They want to do an operation that would take part of her memory, maybe lose her speech, and she'd be paralysed. And yet two months ago, she's going to be a barrister. That's difficult, isn't it? I don't have the answers for that. I believe God does. But I can't give the answers to that. 
the sovereignty of God. But these things come because God is sovereign. If he wasn't sovereign, he couldn't give these things. He's a God who is invincible. He's a God who is eternal. Again, that's so difficult to comprehend when we know, well, this mortal body will give up, but praise God, we have an eternal part within us that God is going to keep. We have a God who is sufficient. We have a God who wonderfully, in the Christmas story, we remember that he became incarnate. God, apart from us, separated from us, moved even farther away, particularly from Rowley, where I live. <laughs> God wouldn't be seen dead in our neighbourhood at the moment. No, he comes to us. He comes with us. God, Emmanuel. What a gift is this? The pivot of all I've said tonight is Christ. All these things come in Christ. They come through Christ. I trust over these last few days that that message has been disclosed to you. If it hasn't, then the ministers of this world are sadly failing. But oh, it is a wonderful thing. We might say, well, why then does the world despise it so much but their despising doesn't take away the beauty the truth the wonder of what Christ is never let anybody else's attitude determine yours particularly when it comes to faith when it comes to trust and when it comes to Christ and I trust, and I say this to myself as I close, I wrote here, we have a responsibility to make this beautiful. <laughs> Do you ever buy anything for, for people at Christmas or give to you, those your nearest and dearest? Something that's really horrible. Joe? You wouldn't do that to Betty. No. <laughs> Betty, you wouldn't do that to <laughs> I can, I can use them, you see, because I know they'll smack me afterwards. That's fine. But we don't give you. You know, I've talked about Christmas these last few weeks, and my, my wife, she, she does all the Christmas things. I, I, I just stand back. It's not because I don't want to get involved, but I, but I know that if I do, I'm just going to get, you know, in the way, really. So I, I stand back. She, she wraps presents to, the, to a, deg a level that I, I just cannot comprehend and I, I can't get paper to do the same you know and I said to her I said you just you just got to go so far haven't you is it not possible just to buy some somebody one thing <laughs> do, do, is anybody else here you, you can't just buy one thing you've got to, you've got to buy that and something else you know and all that, and all of that and so I just and I know if I say anything I'm just gonna get <laughs> so I stand back but but she loves it and she, she makes, these, makes things, these things beautiful. Sometimes when we think about these long words, these long doctrines, we give them that name, don't we, doctrines? And that's a bit of an ugly word itself, isn't it? But I trust that we might know and we might be able to make known that these things are not ugly. These things are not, well, they are complex, but there's a wonderful simplicity that faith can bring them to us. I trust I've tried to make these things beautiful this evening in my poor, poor descriptions of them. But what a gift we have in Christ. I hope we don't discard it with the wrapping paper and all the frivolity and all the consumerism that has come with Christmas but that we might lay hold of it and know the beauty and the value. I think what Paul says in verse 7 as my text for this evening, that in the ages to come, we'll only know the true and full value 
of what God has done in Christ in the ages to come here. Now is just a glimpse of this grace. That, by the way, is an SGA book if you ever want to read it. The glimpses of God's grace. It's just a glimpse that we have now. I trust I might have just given you another glimpse even this evening and that you might know and love this wonderful Saviour, this wonderful Lord, more than we have done previously. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord, we just ask you to just bless your word to us, bless the things of Christ to us, make them real to us, that we might be able to live, even in these coming days, in the light and the reality of it. We thank you for your word. May it be our guide and our model. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher. And may your glory be our only concern. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.